Let's get on with the program for today. It's uh, my honor to introduce our guest speaker today to talk with us about Blue Ocean Strategy, Dr. Munaira Zunir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I just saw that uh, banner for surfing outside, and I just thought I need to share it with you. This past few months, it has been so interesting uh, listening to my associate answering the phone. And he says, yes, sir, we offer Blue Ocean Strategy. No, sir, it's not a surfing training program. <laughs> and, and, you know, it doesn't help being in San Diego. And he goes, it's a beautiful day out there. But no, sir, we do not have surfing. And I was so impressed. By, uh, so any of you who are here for surf training, I apologize. <laughs> the topic that we are going to discuss today is what color is your strategy? Are you red or blue? Can strategy be a color? What does that mean? So these are the basic answers that we are going um, to look into. Um, interestingly, people have interesting thoughts about strategy too. There is a friend of mine who says that he knows what's the best strategy to be rich in life. And he says, you have to do your research right and at the right time uh, to choose really wealthy parents. So that's his strategy. Then there's another friend of mine who says, I know that it's really easy to um, make a million dollars these years. It has become fairly easy. Why is that? Because you can, all you have to do is to start with three millions. And within a year, you would be left with just one. So there are interesting approaches about strategy out there. But what we are going to discuss is what does red strategy mean? What does blue mean? And how do they relate? Now, before I go into that, let me share with you what are we going to achieve today. The first is that I'm going to introduce to you the strategic logic behind blue ocean strategy. What is it that lets companies make competition irrelevant? Then I'm going to share with you some of the tools and frameworks that underlie the blue ocean strategy framework. And then I'm going to briefly address how can companies like yours move from thought to action to actually applying blue ocean strategy to your own problem. And again, now before really diving deep into blue ocean strategy. I want you all to have a look at some of these uh, management functions and think about your daily workload or weekly workload. Think about how much time are you spending on each of these. It's managing costs, better utilization of assets, growth and innovation, let me make it a little bit easier for you. Think about the two sides. What percentage of time do you spend on the right-hand side? And what percentage of time do you spend on the left? Any volunteers? How about 90-10? 90 on? Is this your left or right? That's, our right? That's your right. OK. 90 on right, 10 on left. No? The other way? Why is that? How about 80-20? 80, 80 on this side? No? OK, let's get a few responses. Yes, please. How, how much do you spend on the left? How much on the right? 35 on which side? On growth and innovation. Anybody else? Yes, 70% on this side. OK. Anybody else? Yes, it varies. It varies uh, based on the stage a company is. It also varies based on the hierarchical level that you are in an organization. But by and large, even when I'm talking to senior managers, they would say we are spending about 70 to 75 percent on that side, right? Where do you think growth and profitability really lies? Is growth and profitability on that side or on this side? 
on the right side. When we know that growth and profitability is on that side, why are we spending more time on, uh, is on this side, why are we spending more time on that side? Survival, yes, why else? Does everybody agree that growth and profitability is on this side? Yes, but most of us spend more time on this side, right? Yes, please. Exactly. Yes. How many would say that this is easy? Why is it easy? Yes. You do it every day. Did you learn to do it? Did you learn to manage this side when you went to school? Yes. This side is easy. This side is measurable. This side everybody is comfortable to do. Why? Because when you go to school, this is the side that you learn. You have all the systems that would tell you how to manage costs, how to measure costs, how to manage your performance. This was the total cycle time or efficiency this year. Next year, you have had this certain amount of gain and that. What happens on this side? Why are we not comfortable with this side? It's more abstract. It's more, maybe some people would say long term. Uh, some people would say it's not easily measurable. Um, some people would say it's not really systematic. If we give names to both these sides, that is productivity management. This is creativity management. The reason why people think that is easy and the reason why people spend a lot of time over there is because management science has been focused on that side for the last 30 years. Business schools, management schools have built lots of tools, frameworks, systems, measurement systems that all focus on that side. What happens when we come on this side? What has the management science produced when it comes to this side? Come on. You are taking a course in that. What is, what's the basic management term when you talk about creativity and creativity management? It's innovation, right? There is one buzzword, innovation. And what companies know is if you want to succeed, if you want to uh, stand out of the crowd, all you need to do is innovate. But what is innovation then? Innovation, the word that was coined like in 1945, which is already more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago, by Schumpeter. It still is random. You are supposed to go to sleep, wake up with a great idea, and put it to work. What happens? 98% of the time, the idea fails. 2% of innovations rarely succeed. Right? So the general approach to innovation is that it's random, it's trial and error, it is based on an entrepreneur who has the talent to dream big and to come up with innovative ideas. Does anybody, is anybody familiar with this phrase, opportunities and risks come together? If you want to succeed, you have to be a risk taker, right? Those companies will succeed who have a culture of innovation, who have innovation in their DNA who can bring together people who are not risk averse, but risk takers. And then it's a subsystem approach. That's the standard approach to innovation. <clears throat> and for the last 60 years, a lot of work has been done there, but it still remains random and trial and error. Now, Blue Ocean Strategy challenges that and says, no, just as the productivity side is systematic, it has patterns, it has tools and frameworks, it's learnable. Similarly, creativity is learnable too. It's also systematic, it is based on patterns, it is based on theories and methodologies. It focuses on risk minimization, not risk taking or risk avoiding, but risk minimization, which means identify all the possible risks that are there when you are going for an innovative, profitable move and then minimize them step by step. 
It's based on analytical frameworks and it stresses strategic alignment of the systems. Now the question is, where do these patterns come from? If we say that, okay, this is just as systematic and where are all of these coming from? And this is where the two professors come in who are the founders of Blue Ocean Strategy. These are Professor Chan Kim and Rene Mavon. Both are based at INSEAD in France. And for the last 25 years, they have been tackling this question. What makes an innovation succeed? What makes an innovation fail? Is there any similarity between the innovations if you look back 100 years? Are there any similarities in patterns among all those 2% of the moves that succeeded? What's common in all those 98% that fail? And then they have translated those into the strategic logic of Blue Ocean Strategy. The research, it spanned about <clears throat> a time yeah, of more than 100 years. If you look back 100 years, of course, there are so many of the industries that did not exist, right? Looking back 30 years again, there are so many industries that did not exist. Of course, these industries have been developed. That means there have been innovative moves that have been successful. But equally, the, in fact, much more, there are innovative moves that failed. So what they did was that they were looking for similarities and patterns between everything that succeeded. And what you all confirmed right now, that you think that growth and profitability is on the right side, that is what the professors found too. That even though most of the companies, their moves are generally new business launches, are generally just incremental improvements, so 86% 80, of new launches are just what they call red ocean moves or incremental improvements. Only 14% were the truly innovative moves or the blue ocean moves. And, but these 14% of the moves had a profit impact of 86%, which means that profits, not that there are no profits and no growth on the productivity side, but there are much more chances of profitable growth when you come on the creativity side. That is what their research basically proved. The book has been translated in more than 42 languages up till now. It has had huge success um, worldwide. And that is what we are going to discuss today. What is it that was common or that is common or what is it that can be called the strategic logic of all these innovative moves that became successful. So now let me <clears throat> first introduce why do we use the terms red and blue and why do we use the name blue ocean strategy for that, for that specific. Um, now think about the word strategy. In business strategy, where do you think the word is coming from? It's coming directly from military, right? The very terms we use, they are uh, deeply imbued with military references. We have chief executive officers, we have headquarters, we have troops on the front lines. So described this way, coming, concept coming from the military, described this way, strategy is about fighting over a piece of land that is fixed and constant. And so the gain of one army generally comes at the loss of another one. So one army invades, the other one loses. This is like a zero-sum game. Why? Because one is winning and the other is losing. When you translate it into business terms or in corporate terms, this fixed piece of land becomes the market demand. And that is where businesses start with. They take market demand as a given. They take environmental conditions as a given. So if you were to, for example, start a restaurant business in San Diego, where would you start? Of course, you were going to start with what's the total demand in the area? And where is that coming from? What's the total population? What's the income level? Um, all the demographics and so on. And you would have one figure for the demand. What would be the next step? The next step would be you would find out who are all your competitors. How many other restaurants are there in that area? And what does it become after that? So this is the demand. These are the competitors. You start fighting over the market share, right? 
This is 100% demand. My share this year was 5%. Next year, I want to make it 5.5%, right? So it is like taking market demand as a pie. Your aim is to get a bigger slice of the pie. Again, you can see the same trend here that this is a zero-sum game. If you get a bigger slice, somebody else gets a smaller slice, right? So it's a fixed piece of demand where companies try to get a bigger share of the market. They are sort of fighting with each other. So what can be the color of this type of a conventional approach to strategy? It's red. Why? Because it's the rivals fighting with each other, turning the ocean bloody red. It can be sharks in the ocean fighting for the same demand. And that is why we use the word, uh, the color red. Now, blue ocean strategy, or blue color, is the calm place where there are no rivals, where there are no competitors, and there is no fighting. And that is why it's blue. So whereas companies have long engaged in like head-to-head -head competition, they have um, fought for market share, they have battled for differentiation, the professors suggest that that is, even though it's necessary, it's not enough for profitable growth. For profitable growth, you need to look into other strategic growth options, and Blue Ocean Strategy is one of them. That's the main idea. Now, to understand what's the strategic logic that really differentiates Blue Ocean Strategy from Red Ocean Strategy, so Red Ocean Strategy being the conventional competition-based approaches to strategy, what differentiates them? I have uh, selected three case studies today, and let's discuss those studies. And I want you to identify those similarities and patterns that the professors also identified, so that you would know, OK, this is similar in this, and this was similar in that, and yes, this should be the strategic logic. So the first example I have chosen is an industry where if you were looking for profitable growth, that is where you would like to go. Let's see this attractive industry. How many people want to go in that industry? Really attractive, right? Why do you laugh? Not attractive? Not attractive? Not a growing industry? Why not? Why not? It's dependent on donations. How many of you are fans of orchestra? There are lots of fans. You know why? Because when the orchestra industry defines who their target market are, it's not whether people are rich or poor. Or, it is generally people who, of course, have a certain uh, level of income, but who have at least been to graduate school. So it's the educated people who somehow understand and appreciate music. And that's the target market. Do you think that's a declining market? Is it? I'm not a fan. I don't want to go. Why not? Because I don't understand the music. Do all of you understand it? What's the symphony? What's this and that? I can't, right? But the truth is that it's a declining industry. It's a non-attractive industry. If you were in the orchestra industry, what would you be doing? You would be doing what all the other orchestras were doing. And what is it that the orchestra industry believes in? It believes, for example, that the success of the orchestra depends on a fancy venue. The better the venue, the higher the uh, cost of the ticket, right? It believes that the musicians need to be formal and trained. And what about the audience who are sitting here? Who, who are the audience here? Can you imagine these are the people with black ties, black suit? not allowed to laugh, not allowed to uh, sneeze, have to leave children back at home. So it's a formal attire, serious setting, and they sit and enjoy the music, right? The industry spends about $2 million on the star conductor, and all you get to see is his back, <laughs> right? But that's what the industry believes. If there is a star conductor, the orchestra can bring in more revenues. So looking at the industry, if you were in the orchestra industry, these are the things that you would be doing too. You would like to hire a star conductor. You would like to get a fancy venue. You would like to target the elite people. You would like to 
uh, have a short, smaller um, gathering of elite people, which would be a higher value orchestra, right? That is what you would be doing too. So let's look at the industry in a little detail. The number of concerts has been on a rise. Why? Because the number of concert companies are on a rise. There are a number of concert companies. Yet, the average number of audience per concert has been on a decline. So keep in mind this number 749, which is now the average number of people attending one concert. Where are the revenues coming from? Less than 60% coming from live performance. Less than 2% coming from royalties and recordings. They are generally supported by donations. In Europe, they are mostly donated by the government because the government really want to preserve the traditions. In the US, it's mainly supported by um, private philanthropy, about 40% supported by them. The industry has an unsustainable cost structure. First of all, there is a high fixed cost, which is half of the orchestra costs go to salaries of the people. And conductors, of course, earn a lot. And then there are variable costs that are on, on a rise too, which is <clears throat> higher marketing costs because the companies fight with each other to get to that market share. If you have a big picture view of the industry, this is one of the tools of Blue Ocean Strategy that we use to look at the industry. This is called the Strategy Canvas. On the horizontal axis are the things that the industry believes are the value factors for the customers. Star conductor, star soloist, fancy theater, mannerism and code of conduct for the audience, length of each piece of music, which is generally 22 minutes, size of the orchestra, which is about 100 people in one orchestra, of course, with a high cost then. Production cost, number of concerts has to be low, and that is why you see the curve coming down low. So the industry wants to have lower number of concerts, a smaller venue, use of difficult music that people like me cannot understand. Right? That is what the industry believes in. What are the results? Even the big five, they have uh, deficits running in millions of dollars. So obviously this is uh, not an attractive industry. Right? Now I want to show you an example of somebody who created a blue ocean from within this industry. Of course, he challenged a number of things that the industry believed in. And that was the innovation, right? Changing it to an extent. And he challenged uh, the average number is 15,000. What about the venue? Just as costly as a fancy theater? No, it's a sports stadium. What about the orchestra? What about the audience? So you can see that he challenged a number of things that the industry believed in. First of all, who is the orchestra for? Is it for that pie, the market, that the orchestra industry defines? Or is it for all those people outside of that market? And how to increase the size of the pie so that those other people can come in, so that the little child also pays for the ticket, so that the younger children also pay for the ticket, and so on. So it was looking outside of the market to bring in those non-customers. Of course, he was not better serving the existing customers who want a more refined environment, who want a more sophisticated experience. He brought orchestra music to the outsiders. What are the orchestra companies saying about him? He is a disgrace. This is not classical music, right? That's what they are saying. So does he have competition? He doesn't, because his competitors keep on saying, that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to do it, right? That's what they are saying. But what, what is happening to the profits? Is he getting any profits? Right? So you can see that he made competition irrelevant for him. How? First of all, by moving outside of the market, that the industry focused on. Secondly, by challenging the assumptions to such an extent that the competitors don't, can't even possibly move there. Right? Let's look at the strategy canvas. <clears throat> the blue curve is Andre Roux. 
he eliminated did you see that small boy who was the star soloist you bet he is charging 2 million dollars right <laughs> so he eliminated the costly factors the fancy theater and and so on then he raised a few of the factors above the industry standard he re reduced some of the factors uh, that the industry believed in. And then he created a few factors that the industry had never thought of before, that an orchestra can have audience participation, there can be festive costumes, it can be fast, fun, family atmosphere. The audience get that goodie bag in which they can, they also have some water for gargling because there is a song that uh, has a sound of gargling. So people are having fun in it, right? And so he created a blue ocean by challenging a number of things. Now this is not some random innovation, why? Because there are two things that I want you to look at on this canvas. He is eliminating and reducing things that were either adding cost to the industry or they were not adding much value to the buyers. Not the customers, but the buyers. The, all the people outside of the pie were the buyers, right? So mannerism and code of conduct and length of music and unfamiliarity with music was, were not value factors for them. Similarly, these were the cost factors. So he eliminated or reduced the cost structure of the industry. At the same time, he increased value for the buyers, which is like fun atmosphere, audience participation. Again, he targeted the buyers. And that really is the blue ocean strategic logic that first you have to increase value for the buyers at the same time you have to reduce the cost structure of the industry and it's the simultaneous pursuit of high value and low cost which is blue ocean strategy generally innovation is associated with increased value for the buyers or the people differentiation sometimes comes together with innovation Blue Ocean strategy suggests that only those innovations would succeed which would have high value, but at the same time, low cost structure for the industry. Low cost doesn't mean low price. Low cost means low cost structure so that there is value for the company too. So that's the basic strategic logic. Let's look at another example to see if you see that same strategic logic there too. And this is about the video gaming industry, and this is pro V, because the example is V. And how many of you are fans of video games? You know, the exact definition is young males, and I'm so happy to see that you are still in that. Yes, so that young males definition sometimes extends to 40, to 50, to wherever, but the traditional market is, for the video gaming industry, is young males. Now, I have two teenage boys who are great fans, and I obviously am not. And why am I not? Because they are sitting in the living room, and they are playing and playing and playing and playing. And if I am out on a workshop and I go back home at 6, still sitting there and playing, right? And there are a number of other, of course, factors that make me dislike it. Uh, there is no interaction between me and him. What happens when I try to play with him? I've tried to play with him, by the way. He doesn't want to play with me because I lose, right? I, I can't control that video, uh, that 3D controller, and somehow he doesn't want to play with me. I would rather have him like go and play tennis outside because it's healthy, it has more active and so on. But, and what do you think they are playing? Like I can f fully control that he doesn't go and watch R-rated movies but he is playing E-rated or M-rated games which are violence and which are M-rated for violence and blood violence. So all they are doing is that's all that's going on, right? I definitely don't like it and so do most of the other moms, to people that I know. What is the industry doing? So it's Microsoft, Xbox and PlayStation. What do they believe? They believe that every three or four years there has to be a new console which is supposedly uh, have to have higher processing power, more uh, 
HD TV compatibility, non-gaming functionality, DVD resolution, HD resolution, I don't know, so many things which basically mean more technological advancement, millions of dollars going into research, R&D, so that PlayStation 3 comes out better than, than the Xbox. And so they keep on fighting with each other as to who comes up with a, with a better version. <clears throat> the available game titles, of course, are on a decline. Fighting, 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 right? Now, <clears throat> Nintendo Wii is the example of a company which is not like looking back at history, but really applying the tools of Blue Ocean strategy to create their Blue Ocean. So the president says, we are not competing against Sony or Microsoft. We are battling the indifference of people who have no interest in video games. We want to appeal to mothers who don't want consoles in their living rooms. They want to appeal to me, right? And to the elderly and to young women. So that is where they started. This is the market. These are the young males who are outside of it. Why are mothers outside of it? Why are the elderly people outside of it? What can they change so that they can target that market where the competitors are not focused on. So let's again see a little video of what they did and the markets that they went after, and I'll show you what their results are. What do you think I've been suggesting to my son to get for his birthday for the last three years? He still doesn't want to have it. He doesn't like it. He is the target market. Nintendo is not better serving the existing target market. I was impressed when I went to the, um, I worked with Ohio State University Medical Center last year and they had a requirement that all of their rehab centers had to have a Nintendo V there because they are using it for therapy and they are using it for keeping the older people engaged and. and and so on. What do you think happens when the granddad goes fishing with his grandson? Who wins? Generally granddad wins. And then the son is next day when he's coming back from school, he's the one he wants to get hold of again because he wants to beat him, right? So it brings the families together and so on. And what are the results? The re Nintendo Wii has been selling at the rate of one unit per second since its launch on 19th November 2006. And it is because we all have become markets for the Nintendo Wii. To buy it for our children, to buy it for our brother, for this, for that. And profits reached 1.5 billion, which is 440. 
2,000 per employee in 2007, much more than what Google and Sony put it. Now, what's the most interesting part? Did anybody notice the high resolution 3D graphics there? No. So the most interesting part over here is that whereas the industry loses, the, while Sony loses 240 to $300 on each console sold, Nintendo is making $50 on each unit. Industry believed that you do not make money on the consoles, you make money on the games. And that n number of games is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, right? Nintendo is using a processor which is 10 years old, and that is why they have been able to make money on the console. So every console sold, they make money on it. They are not targeted on the improving the processing power, improving the graphics and so on. So they are making money on the consoles. Secondly, because they are using this 10-year-old processor, they have a huge pool of games that, for example, I learned. So I can play golf and I can play tennis and I can enjoy those games. So again, let's see the same pattern here that Nintendo eliminated and reduced what? Not what they just thought they should, but things that reduced the industry cost structure. Processing power, non-gaming functionalities, R&D into technological advancement. Raised and then created just these two new factors which the industry had not thought of before. You can, can you see the same pattern again? Increasing value for, no, for the buyers or the non-customers while reducing the cost structure for the industry. And so that, again, is the strategic logic of Blue Ocean Strategy. Let's quickly look at the third example before we go into the tools and the frameworks. The third example is from a totally diverse industry, and that's, this is aerospace defense. Consider, uh, imagine a price tag of $190 million. What do you think that is? It's the price of one fighter jet, F-22, $190 million. Uh, every year, 10 new F-22s are added to the Air Force fleet. By 2011, I think the Air Force would have 187 in all. So for a long time, there has been a debate that the inability to cut aircraft costs is a key vulnerability in the long-term uh, military strength of the United States. Yet, that is how it is. Now imagine another price tag, which is $33 million. And you would be amazed to see that here, that that is also a jet fighter plane. That's the JSF F-35. I'm sorry, I got of echo. Is it too loud? Is it okay? Okay, so that's the JSF F-35, which is supposedly eight times better than the legacy um, air-to-ground um, battle attack. It's four times better than the, um, uh, I think, in what? In reconnaissance and defense. So it's much superior in, um, in its ability to the planes that the Air Force has, the Navy has, and also the Army has. This Joint Strike Fighter is meant for all three branches rather than just the Air Force. Now, how was that made possible? Now, if you look at how the military industry traditionally designs and orders its planes, they order it differently. Why? Because their perceptions of what an ideal plane is totally different. So the Air Force, for example, wants a plane um, which is the fastest. I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable with the loud voice. It's okay? Okay. So the Air Force um, wants to have the superior air uh, performance and that is why they have, uh, they focus on agility, they focus on stealth so that they are invisible to the enemy radars. What do the Marines want? They want that their plane should, they should be, <clears throat> it hovers like a helicopter, yet it performs as a jet engine. And it has countermeasures so that it can evade the low altitude um, uh, missile attack. And what about the Navy? 
With aircrafts that are stationed like thousands of miles away from the nearest maintenance hangar, they want to have an aircraft that is um, maintainable, easily maintainable, yet strong as a Mack truck so that it can absorb the carrier landings and also constant exposure to salt air. So their perceptions of what an ideal plane is has been different for a long time, and that is why these are three different industries. The plane that's designed for the Air Force is not supposed to be for the Marines. It's not supposed to be for the Navy. Now, the JSF project, what it did was that it tried to figure out what were the most important features. The industry has been focusing on design customization, weapons customization, mission customization, and lots of customizations for, for all of these different branches. So they tried to figure out what are the most important of the things. Let's just focus on those and eliminate and reduce everything else. And that's what they did. They found that the answer for Air Force came down to just stealth and agility. For Navy, it was maintainability and durability. For Marines, it was short takeoff and vertical landing and countermeasures. So they focused on just these six factors, eliminated everything else. And what was that everything else? It was design customization, it was weapons customization, it was mission customization, thereby making a plane which was much low in cost structure, so $33 million as compared to $190 million, so much low in cost structure, yet had value for a huge market, not just the Air Force market, not just the Navy market, not just the Marines market, but for all of them. So in 2001, the largest military aircraft contract was signed with Lockheed Martin, and the first JSF-35 is supposed to be delivered in 2010. And of course, it's a huge blue ocean strategy for a number of reasons. One, it has shown to the government how spending can be optimized. Secondly, it has the support of all three branches, which has never happened before. Thirdly, it lowers the cost structure, and offers exceptional value at the same time. So you can see the same pattern over here too. In a nutshell, if we had to describe what Blue Ocean strategy is, it's basically a strategic alignment of three propositions. One is the value proposition, which is for the buyers. What is it that the buyers are getting from that offering? The second is the profit proposition. How does the company make profit out of it. And the third is the people proposition, which means what motivates the employees, the partners, the people to make it a success. And it has to be a strategic alignment of all three propositions that makes a good blue ocean strategy. Missing any of these propositions, you, are, you can be innovative, it can fail, it can pass. So basic contribution of blue ocean strategy really is that there is just general notion, innovation is good. What they are saying is, there can be good innovation, there can be bad innovation. Which innovation is good? It's basically value innovation that brings together these three propositions together. And it's a strategic alignment of those three propositions which uh, make a good blue ocean strategy. Is that clear? What is the strategic logic of blue ocean strategy? So if we were to compare now Blue Ocean strategy with the traditional approaches to strategy, these are the basic things. The first thing, of course, is instead of trying to get a bigger share of the market, Blue Ocean strategy focuses on increasing the size of the market. See? Bake a bigger pie rather than get a bigger slice. The second is, whereas traditional strategies focus on getting a bigger share of the customers, better serving the customers, Blue Ocean Strategy focuses on non-customers. How can you bring non-customers into the industry? Have you ever heard of a non-customers questionnaire? Let's send a questionnaire to the non-customers, right? Let's find out what do they want. Because we all know what do customers want. They want more for less price. Whatever you are offering, they want more of that for a lower price. But Blue Ocean Strategy starts by asking, who are the non-customers? Why are they non-customers? What can you change so that you can take your offering to them? 
Then the third important difference is that the traditional approach to strategy is let's either differentiate. So you, your offering is better than the competitors. That differentiated offering generally comes at a premium price. So that's one approach, which is differentiation. The other approach is let's go for the lower segment of the market. Let's take out some important, uh, some, some of the features. Let's bring our cost structure down. Let's go for the lower end of the market. So that's the low cost strategy. It's traditionally said, do not get stuck in the middle. So if you do not have a differentiation strategy, if you do not have the um, cost leadership, you are sort of doomed. Right? You cannot have, for example, the same quality as everybody else, but more expensive than the others. So the traditional approaches are you either pursue differentiation or you pursue low cost. Blue ocean strategy is when you pursue them both simultaneously. Your offering has to be high value, yet it has to be low cost. And again, you need to remember that it's not high value and low price. It is high value and low cost for you so that you have enough of a profit margin to make profits yourself. And then, <clears throat> whereas traditional strategies focus on segmentation, so you define a market and say, this is a little segment which I can better serve. And you go and tailor your needs to that specific segment. That's the traditional segmentation approach. Blue Ocean strategy looks at desegmentation. How can you desegment the market? How can you look at shared needs so that you can uh, create a blue ocean? Sometimes you can have high value and low cost, yet you are focused on that small niche. What happens? You end up creating a blue swimming pool. Right? And what happens when competitors come into that swimming pool later on? your profit margins again shrink. So you have to make sure that the market size that you are creating, it's looking at shared needs, and that is why the size of the market is huge. And then the last difference is, which we have not discussed today, it's the execution part of strategy. No strategy is good just by being formulated good enough. Good strategy has to be executed well enough too. And Blue Ocean strategy also uses like tipping point leadership and fair process to ensure that strategy execution is built into the formulation process so that it's not that you have an excellent strategy which later on does not get implemented properly. And so that's the last important difference. Traditionally, strategies are formulated in closed rooms and then rolled out. Some of them succeed, some of them fail. Blue Ocean strategy, the process, it um, builds execution into the formulation process right from the very beginning. So these are the basic differences between Blue Ocean Strategy. Now let me share with you some of the tools that we discussed that the professors, for example, first of all found the similarities, then they translated them into tools and frameworks that anybody could use and learn, just like on the productivity side. And they tested these tools and frameworks in different companies and refined them over time. So what we have right now is a systematic process and tools and frameworks and methodologies that make it a systematic process for any company to say, I want to now start apply, uh, I want to now create my blue ocean. There is a systematic process for that. And we talked about that blue ocean strategy minimizes all the risks, right? It's not about risk taking, it's not about um, avoiding risk. Blue Ocean Strategy is focused on the six principles which, are, which address six different risks that are associated with strategy, formulation, and execution. One is the search risk. How do you come up with the right idea? It has a principle called reconstruct market boundaries. Offers a tool for reconstructing market boundaries to look outside um, of your market to come up with the right ideas. How to pick up the right idea from the haystack to make sure that that idea is going to work. Then there is a planning risk. In companies, what, what happens? You have a strategic planning document that's, that's this thick. It lies on the top shelf. All you read is the executive summary. Blue Ocean Strategy uses all visual tools, which are one-page tools, so that you are always focused on the big picture. Where are you? Where are your competitors? 
are now competitors making your ocean red, you can always keep your view on the big picture. And that minimizes the planning risk because you keep your focus on the big picture. The third risk is the scale risk. And that is how do you make sure that you are not going after a pool and going after an ocean so that the scale risk is minimized and so that you can reach beyond existing demand. And we have tools for that too. Then there is the business model risk, <clears throat> which is that you have an idea that fails. Blue Ocean Strategy has a strategic sequence that we follow, which is going from utility to price to cost. And I'll show you those tools in a moment. That are it. And then on the execution side too, there are two very important risks. One is the management risk. You don't have a motivated team and it fails. Your company fails, uh, your strategy fails. Secondly, there are a number of organizational risks. You have a great strategy, you don't have the resources. You have political hurdles. You have cognitive hurdles in an organization. You have management hurdles in an organization. So Blue Ocean Strategy uses tools to systematically address all those hurdles too when we go uh, for strategy execution. So these are some of the tools that we use. That's the Pioneer Migrator Settlers Map, which is used to identify where do you start applying Blue Ocean Strategy. What's your overall portfolio? Where do you start? We have the four actions framework, which we are going to look at in a little bit more detail so that you can get started on your Blue Ocean Strategy. We have the three tiers of non-customers, because when you say non-customers, the non-customers are the universe, right? This is your market. The non-customers are the universe. You need to find a systematic way of it, dividing them into some similarities so that you can bring them into your market. So we use the three tiers of non-customers framework. We use the six parts framework to reconstruct market boundaries and to look outside of your, um, of your traditional competition-based uh, uh, boundary. Then some of the other tools are the Blue Ocean Strategic Sequence, which is the Blue Ocean Strategy business model which goes from buyer utility to strategic price to target cost. The traditional approach is that you would have a great idea and then you would try to figure out, okay, this has great utility for the buyers. The second step generally is that you try to figure out how much is it going to cost you to produce that, right? Once you have that cost, you would figure out what's the break even value. What should be the price to break even? At least this should be the price. To make some profits, I need to increase the price to a little extent. Blue Ocean Strategy takes the reverse round. It says this is the utility, buyer utility. The second step is what is the strategic price? What is it that these non-customers are willing to pay for this increased value? And then it tries to, so the second step is setting the price. The third step is what's the profit margin that I want to keep? And then the fourth step is, okay, what's the target cost? And then you try to figure out how can you achieve that target cost. Of course, we have different frameworks again to figure out how to achieve that target cost so that cost innovations are there, pricing innovations are there, so that you can lower your cost structure. What do you need to eliminate and so on. But the system is sort of like reversed from the traditional approach. And then, of course, we go on to address what are the adoption hurdles? Are employees ready to embrace it? Are, part, are your business partners ready to embrace it? Are people willing to accept it? And so you need to have a yes on all of them to make sure that your Blue Ocean idea is viable. Again, it comes down to minimizing all the risks that you can possibly encounter in creating your Blue Ocean. And we have the buyer utility map. There are a host of other uh, tools that we can use. The most interesting thing, which was not in the book and which is like a development after the book, that's the Blue Ocean strategy formulation process. So when, for example, I work with companies helping them create their Blue Oceans, it is this one, two, three step-by-step -step process that we follow. Identifying, for example, in the first step, where do you want to apply the Blue Ocean strategy? Then visualizing their current strategy with the as is strategy canvas, understanding their customer experiences, understanding who their non-customers are, exploring the non-customers, and 
using the other tools to get to that to be strategy canvas which is your um, which is your blue ocean strategy so now let's end this presentation with a few simple things that you can do to analyze your current strategy and to get started on blue ocean strategy first is some simple questions that you need to ask most of you I am sure would have a no as an answer are you offering exceptional value at drastically low cost anybody who says yes exceptionally high value at dra drastically low cost wow good are you creating new demand instead of better serving um, instead of striving to do better than the competitors any other yes one yes good are you looking for non customers instead of trying to get a bigger share of the customers of the industry yeah <laughs> say yes good are you challenging assumptions and reconstruction constructing industry and market boundaries let's focus on that group because we got two yeses from there are you challenging your industry assumptions yes good we might have a blue ocean company there good are you pursuing desegmentation instead of segmentation are you trying to focus on specialized needs of a small segment or are you pursuing desegmentation and looking for widely shared needs generally we hardly get two or more of yeses on these do you have voluntarily participating self initiated teams or do you really have to push your employees to work or do you really have to incentivize your employees to work do you execute strategies while conserving time and resources these are simple questions that will first of all tell you that you need to challenge your existing approach to strategy that you can possibly um, explore other strategic growth options because once you answer these questions you would know that you are really in that red ocean where most of the companies are secondly <clears throat> what you can do today is that you can use the simplest tool which is called the strategy canvas the strategy canvas is just a two dimensional graph on the horizontal axis you have to write the important value factors from the point of view of the customers of your industry that is where you start because you look at your current industry so you only focus on the customer write down the value factors that are important then you draw your industry curve what does the industry focus on if some if there are things that the industry believes should be high the plotting on the curve should be high if there are things that should be low the plotting on the curve should be low so draw the curve for your industry then draw a curve for yourself most of the times you would see both of them are almost the same a little bit different i am doing this one thing different than the industry i am really innovative i am really high on this one thing but generally they are similar if you are in a red ocean so you can get started by first identifying these value factors here secondly drawing your um, as is curve the next step is to look at this simple framework which is called the four actions framework and try to answer four questions from those value factors which are the factors that the industry takes for granted that should be eliminated which are some of the factors that can be reduced well below the industry level which are some of the factors that can be raised well above the industry level are there any factors which the industry has never thought of before that you can possibly create so draw your curve think about your industry and try and answer these four questions and these are those simple steps that should get you started on um, blue ocean strategy what are the eight, eight to ten elements what does the industry value curve look like what does your company's value curve look like 
Apply the four action <coughs> framework to identify what to eliminate, reduce, raise and create. Redraw your value curve to see where you want to go. So that brings us to the end and uh, to blue oceans to all of you and to the misled servers too. <laughs> and uh, I'm open to any questions now. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm open. We have I don't a couple of questions. We're, we're getting late. a little bit over on time here, so I'm going to commit that we do have more breakfast outside. We can go out and continue this conversation.